Welcome to the Yale 20. My name is Dr. Perlman, and today we're going to talk about acute pancreatitis. Uh, this talk was prepared with the help of Dr. Harry Aslanian, one of the faculty at Yale. So the purpose of our talk really is to talk about acute pancreatitis in a patient who's presenting new to the hospital. And the questions that we all have to ask ourselves when we're seeing a new patient is really, how sick is my patient? What's the overall treatment approach for my patient? Do we know what the diagnosis is? In the case of acute pancreatitis, we certainly want to make the confirmatory diagnosis with the clinical criteria that we're about to discuss. We also want to wonder why the patient has the, the inflammatory process that's causing his acute pancreatitis, and that we'll investigate that a little bit further. Once we've made the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, we have to figure out what the appropriate treatment for our patient will be. This will depend on how severe the pancreatitis really is and whether or not the patient needs to be admitted to the hospital, a general medicine floor if admitted, or if an intensive care unit. After we've figured out the appropriate way to treat the patient, we're going to focus on how to write up the actual assessment and plan. That's going to include focusing on the descriptive factors as well as what we expect to see in the patient's recovery timeline. Finally, we'll finish off with a few take-home points and additional resources that might be of use to you as you go through your training. So once we are asked to evaluate the patient, we really have to make that decision of how sick our patient really is and whether or not they need to be admitted, and if so, where. There's several validated criteria that help us make this decision. One of the le lesser known criteria is something called the HAPS score. HAPS stands for the Harmless Acute Pancreatitis Score. This is a relatively straightforward system that aims to assess whether or not a patient is going to have a complicated course of acute pancreatitis or not. This score consists of three questions. Does the patient have rebound tenderness? Does the patient have normal creatinine? And does the patient have normal hematocrit? A score of zero is associated with the absence of pancreatic necrosis. There will be no need for dialysis or even artificial ventilation. People are actually unlikely to have any fatal event in 97% of cases in patients with a score of zero. HAPS criteria has a 98% predictive, positive predictive value. And so if a patient really does have a HAPS score of zero, we could probably comfortably make a decision that they may not need to be admitted, or if so, just a general medicine floor with close observation will be sufficient. Now, if the patient doesn't have a score of zero when you try to do the HAPS criteria, there are several other modalities that I'm sure you've heard of that can be useful in assessing how sick the patient is. So there's different scores that we probably talk about in medical school depending where you've gone. So if you're from New York in the Northeast, you may have heard of the Ranson criteria, which was developed in NYU, whereas other people like to use the Apache system or the BICEP score. Personally, I prefer the BICEP score, and the reason I do is because it's simple and the acronym is in the name, so you can easily memorize it. BICEP stands for the Bedside Index of Severity in Acute Pancreatitis. The score consists of B for BUN greater than 25, I that could be used to stand for insane but really reflects a Glasgow Como scale less than 15, S stands for the SERS criteria, and so having two of the four SERS criteria gives you a one point for that component of the BICEP score. Age, patients age over the age of 60, and the presence of a P, pleural effusion, on a chest x-ray. Just a little visual aid to help you memorize. The BU1 is for the bun. Insane is certainly a shout-out to The Shining, a great movie. SERS, we see systemic inflammation the age over 60, and an x-ray where we see a pleural effusion that can be seen right here. Once we figured out the BICEP score for a patient, we, sh we really should assess what that score is telling us in the clinical setting. So just to remind everybody, a BICEP score of 0 to 2 is associated with a low mortality on this hospitalization. The likelihood of mortality is less than 2% for a patient with a BICEP score less than 2. On the other hand, a BICEP score of 3 to 5 is, a, is associated with higher mortality on this hospitalization, translating to about a mortality of 15%. Once we have a sense of how ill the patient is, using several modalities that we just discussed, that's when we start to make a decision whether or not the patient will need to be admitted, admitted to a general medicine floor, or actually have to go to the ICU. The triage of a patient with acute pancreatitis will certainly depend on the severity of the pancreatitis. Now, the criteria that we utilize to help distinguish how severe the pancreatitis is, is the modified Atlanta criteria, and they base uh, the severity on end organ damage, which is further derived from the Marshall score, which I think is a bit too complicated for this, this time in our discussion. 
A mild acute pancreatitis has no organ failure, there's no local or systemic complications, and likely would have a HAP score of near zero or a BICEP score of two or less. On the other hand, a moderately severe acute pancreatitis will certainly have transient organ failure. Now, transient is defined by having signs of organ failure that last less than 48 hours and or local systemic complications, but they have resolved in under the 48-hour time frame. This typically can be an elevated creatinine. It could be an elevated troponin in the system. Last but certainly not least is severe acute pancreatitis. Now, this is demonstrated with persistent organ failure lasting greater than 48 hours, and this in the same way that moderately severe is reflected with the presence of abnormal creatinine lasting outside the window of 48 hours, as well as possibly elevated troponin and even an elevated lactate reflecting hypoperfusion of the organ systems. Now, I know the topic of our talk is acute pancreatitis, but it's also important to recognize that acute pancreatitis as a clinical entity presents with general abdominal pain most frequently. Now, it's important to then talk about other things that may sound similar or look similar in a clinical setting, and we should focus on some of the differentiating features of the pathology of acute pancreatitis and the general clinical presentation. Some of the common things that we want to talk about is biliary stones and biliary colic, which certainly can present with upper quadrant pain, typically on the right side, and can frequently be mistaken for acute pancreatitis and vice versa. Some of the other important features to consider of a patient presenting with abdominal pain is whether or not they have a history of dyspepsia or GERD or even epigastric herniation. We also want to consider the sex and age of a patient. Certainly, if this is a young lady coming in with a recently missed period, we want to think about whether or not this could be a ectopic pregnancy or just a miscarriage of a pregnancy or, or just pelvic inflammatory disease. The other things we should think about is whether or not the patient has any history of kidney stones or risk factors for kidney stones because this could be the first presentation of that pathology as well. Now that we spent a little bit of time talking about the differential of abdominal pain for a patient coming into the hospital, we should get back to the topic at hand, which is acute pancreatitis. So the question really becomes is how do we make the diagnosis? Do we need imaging? Do we need further lab testing? And whether or not the clinical exam alone is sufficient? And so acute pancreatitis really is a clinical diagnosis. There's three criteria, and a patient meeting two of those three criteria can be safely said to have acute pancreatitis, and then we would default back to our scoring criteria to better assess the severity. So the criteria that we talk about when we're trying to make the diagnosis stem from the history and physical examination, some lab findings, and imaging if the diagnosis cannot be made by the first two criteria. So starting with the most inexpensive part of our evaluation is the history and physical. You want to speak to the patient and to figure out whether or not they have any pre-existing conditions that may cause them to be more likely to have acute pancreatitis. Do they have a heavy alcohol use history? Have they been recently started on any new medications? Are they a diabetic? All of those factors have actually been associated with an increased likelihood of having acute pancreatitis, even spontaneously. A social history is of paramount importance in these folks. You, it's important to find out whether or not they have a heavy alcohol use history, whether or not they're a smoker, because both of those factors contribute greatly to the likelihood of acute pancreatitis. Another factor to consider is actually a family history. Do, is there any history of autoimmune diseases? Because autoimmune pancreatitis may present at just about any age and certainly would be a shame to miss it. You want to focus on what the symptoms were when they first started. And is it typical of the acute pancreatitis presentation that we read about in a book? So when we say typical symptoms, usually it's abdominal pain in the left upper quadrant. It radiates to the back, sometimes to the apigastrium, and even to the right side as well. It usually feels better when the patient is sitting forward, and sometimes it's associated with nausea and vomiting. Any oral intake tends to make these people feel worse, and therefore they've been avoiding eating for quite some time. On examination, you'll appreciate typically tenderness to palpation at the epigastrium, left upper quadrant, and at times at the periumbilical area as well. The patient will look to be in a seated position or in a curled up position laying on the bed, and that's because there's some relief provided by being in flexion. Some of the things that we typically look for are also signs on examination. So we may look at hematomas occurring in the inguinal area, in the periumbilical area, or in the flanks. And those signs we'll get to in just one minute, and I'll show you some excellent pictures of those. 
Now, once your suspicion has been raised by the history and the physical, there's some testing that we usually do to try to confirm the diagnosis. The most classic test that we talk about is the lipase. An amylase may be added to the laboratory workup, but certainly it's less specific than a lipase and therefore is of lower utility if you ask me. Now, the typical cutoff that we want to see for a lipase in an acute pancreatitis patient is a level greater than three to five times the upper limit of normal. If we're not able to make the diagnosis by the first two criteria, which is the clinical examination and history and the presence of a lipase that is greater than three to five times the upper limit of normal, at that point, we may have to rely on imaging modalities to help us clinch the diagnosis. The preferred imaging modality is contrast enhanced CT, but as I said, we usually reserve it until a moment where we're not sure of the diagnosis or if we're questioning if there's more pathology than just the acute pancreatitis. Now, the next question we should certainly try to answer is, how useful are these things that we're using to make this diagnosis? So there was a wonderful article that looked at the likelihood ratios that helped predict whether or not having one or two or three of these criteria would be useful in making the diagnosis. So here we see the likelihood ratio for each one of these criteria. So the history and physical has a likelihood ratio of 3.2. So a positive likelihood ratio of 3.2 is pretty helpful in making the diagnosis. We also see that the most helpful test is the lipase. It has a likelihood ratio of 30 and a sensitivity of 96%. Last but certainly not least, the imaging modality, contrast enhanced CT, has a likelihood ratio of 5.57, but I do want to bring your attention to this fact right here, that the sensitivity of the test is only 78%. Now, it's also important to recognize that the timing of imaging is important. If the test is done too early, it could actually miss some of the changes, specifically necrosis of the pancreas that happens in severe acute pancreatitis. So even more reason that if we could make the diagnosis with one and two, we should avoid three. Now getting back to our clinical examination, as I mentioned, the things that make us think about acute pancreatitis are some of the classics. We've all heard about the Gray-Turner sign, Cullen sign, and one that might be new to some of you folks is the Fox sign. So all of these signs demonstrate hematoma formation that is visible on the skin. You see in the gray turner that typically it's in the flank. Cullen sign is associated with periumbilical hematoma formation. And we see Fox sign that I said may be new to some of you, which is a hematoma formation near the inguinal area. All of these signs are really associated with necrotizing acute pancreatitis. If we're able to make the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis without the need for contrast-enhanced CT because of the clinical history and the lipase, There's other imaging modalities that we could utilize to have a better understanding of the clinical process the patient is going through. So some of the classic things that we think about when we talk about acute pancreatitis are these findings that we see on plain x-rays of the abdomen. If we're able to make the diagnosis based on the clinical criteria alone, which is the history and physical and the lipase level, that we do not require to obtain a contrast-enhanced CT, abdominal x-rays may still be of benefit in clinching the diagnosis. Typical things that we look for on abdominal imaging is a sentinel loop sign, which occurs because of inflammation and an ileus that occurs because of the edema related to the peripancreatic inflammatory process occurring in acute pancreatitis. Some of the other things that we could see is the colon cutoff sign, which again occurs because of the edema occurring in the surrounding area, again because of the inflammatory process he's driving forward. What I don't have to show you here is an image of a pleural effusion, but it's something that I think we've seen in the past. And if you look back in the lecture where we had the bicep score displayed, that's where you see a nice layering meniscus on the left side consistent with uh, pl- uh, with a pleural effusion. Again, that's really helpful to understand the severity of the peripancreatic inflammation and the fact that the pleural infusion formed certainly gives us a point on the bicep alone. Now that we've made the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis using our clinical criteria, we have to make a decision about treatment. And the treatment choice really will depend on whether or not this is a mild pancreatitis, an acute pancreatitis that's more severe, that requires a hospitalization or a hospitalization at the intensive care unit. So an acute pancreatitis that is very mild and has a HAPS score of zero can actually be managed as an outpatient. The typical management in this case really would be encouraging oral fluid intake, avoidance of triggers such as alcohol and certain medications that we suspect may be the cause. 
This can include some of the diabetes medications, some statins, and even some ACE inhibitors. And then having close follow-up and a reliable patient to ensure that their symptoms are resolving. Now, in the event that the patient has a more severe form of acute pancreatitis, one that requires an inpatient hospitalization, the mainstay of treatment really has to be the one thing that we're about to talk about. IV fluids have been shown to be one of the most important factors in recovery for patients with moderate, severe, and severe acute pancreatitis. Now, when initiating treatment of a patient for moderate or severe acute pancreatitis, it's important to obtain an IV, that goes almost without saying, and then initiating IV fluid resuscitation. Now, it's important to also assess the volume status of a patient, and knowing their history is, is certainly helpful. If they have severe cardiac disease, you may not want to be as aggressive as you typically would. On average, your approach to patient's hydration should be about 250 to 500 cc's per hour, and if the patient is hypotensive, it's certainly appropriate to give them boluses of a liter of fluid. Now, the question of which fluid to choose very frequently goes unanswered. There is some evidence that lactated ringers is superior to normal saline in the event of moderate and severe acute pancreatitis. Now, this evidence is moderate quality, but should certainly be considered when you're making the choice of what to do for a patient. Now, aggressive fluid resuscitation really stems back from the fact that the pathology and pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis is an inflammatory process that causes dilation of the parenchyma and a lot of extravasation of the intravascular fluid. So it's very important to understand that fluid resuscitation really is the mainstay of treatment for these folks. Now, certainly, you're not going to treat them with aggressive hydration of 500 cc's an hour for a very long time, and you should be addressing their volume status and assessing it every one to two hours. Fluid hydration has really been shown to be most beneficial in the first 12 to 24 hours, but it's also important to understand that you shouldn't be running IV fluids at 250 to 500 cc's an hour without checking in the volume status of the patient. So when you're doing this, it's very important that you come back every one to two hours and look at their volume status. You can assess that by looking at their mucous membranes, looking for edema of the lower extremities, and evaluating the pulmonary system by listening to the lungs for crackles, and even looking at the pulse ox to see if they're having a decrease in saturation, which may be related to the fact that they're becoming volume overloaded. Pain management is also very important in the event of acute pancreatitis, and at this time, morphine or hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid, are certainly appropriate. I know there's some old lore about sphincter avodi dysfunction in the association of morphine, but really that's never been shown to be the case in the literature. Another factor to consider in a patient with acute pancreatitis, especially one who has signs or symptoms of systemic inflammation and even SIRS, is whether or not antibiotics are actually indicated for these folks. If clinically you suspect that a patient may be having an infectious process on top of the acute pancreatitis alone, certainly antibiotics are more than appropriate. But if you're thinking of just prophylaxing against a possible infection that will happen down the line, there is no evidence to show that starting prophylactic antibiotics in acute pancreatitis really has any benefit for the patient. Another thing not to be forgotten is when can we start feeding our patients? And this is where the question of diet comes into play. Really, the old adage of they're not allowed to eat because they need pancreas rest is kind of gone out of favor. If a patient is telling you that they're able to eat, it's certainly appropriate to start them on a diet. And be mindful that, yes, we've all been taught that clear liquids are the way to go, but the data suggests that a low-fat solid diet is just as good and probably tastes a whole lot better. Now that we've spoken a little bit about the mainstays of treatment, it's time to actually write down and put your money down on our diagnosis. It's important to approach this in the way that you would like to see it in a note, something that tells your patient's story and your reasoning and why you chose what you chose and why you treated the way you did. So what you should focus on in your assessment is describing the host, describing the history and predisposing factors. You should mention any criteria that you used to come to the conclusion of whether you admitted them to a medicine floor or to an ICU, any imaging that may support or refute your diagnosis, and certainly you should comment on the degree of disease using the modified Atlanta classification. Just to remind you, the modified Atlanta classification is, pres is mild acute pancreatitis, moderately severe, and severe, and those really were determined by the presence of acute organ failure and the persistence of organ failure beyond 48 hours. And so here we have an example of a patient that we may be called to see in the emergency room. And so here we look at, at all the factors described to help build our case for why we think that Mr. Smith certainly is suffering from acute pancreatitis. We see his age, 
And as we recall from the bicep score, an age over 60 is a predictor of bad things happening. It's got hypertension, diabetes, and ongoing tobacco use. So many of those factors are associated with acute pancreatitis as well. Tobacco use is an independent factor. And then diabetes, along with some of the medications that we use to treat it, can certainly predispose folks to uh, having acute pancreatitis as well. Now, we see that he presented through the emergency room with a classic abdominal picture, left upper quadrant pain radiating to the back. He had tachycardia, which would suggest that he's hypovolemic. His labs demonstrated a leukocytosis greater than 12,000, which is part of the SIRS criteria. And if we couple it with the fact that he had tachycardia, we again can say that it gets another point for the bicep. A lipase greater than five times the upper limit of normal is one of our criteria on its own. And then the chest x-ray and physical examination, which did not have evidence of a pleural effusion. Overall, we thought this was consistent with acute pancreatitis, and his bicep score was three, which was concerning for a moderately severe pancreatitis. So let's take a look at why he actually has a bicep score of three and see if that's correct. He gets a point certainly for the fact that he's got his age over the age of 60. We don't have a BUN for him, but I suspect that if it was elevated above 25, this would be mentioned. So we could kind of take that off our list. We take a look if, if there's any mention of his mental status, which does not seem to be the case. And so his Glasgow coma scale is assumed to be above 15. The presence of SIRS can be made by the fact that he's got a leukocytosis greater than 14, and he has a tachycardia, which we can assume to then meet SIRS criteria together with those two factors. There's no evidence of a chest x-ray or physical examination that would suggest that he has a pleural effusion. And so overall, this actually should be a score of two, not a three. So now that we've made the diagnosis and built the case for why we think that Mr. Smith is suffering from acute pancreatitis, we have to make a decision of whether to admit him and how we'll treat him. Given everything that we see here with this, with his bicep score of two, and the fact that he has a leukocytosis and his age, I would certainly admit him to a general medicine floor and go ahead and treat him for his moderately severe acute pancreatitis. So the plan of treatment then for Mr. Smith has to go back to what we talked about as the mainstays of, of the approach for this gentleman. Now that we've agreed that based on our criteria, physical examination, and all the findings coming together, Mr. Smith is likely suffering from moderate severe acute pancreatitis. And it's time to write a medical plan that we're going to use to treat him in the next few days. Given that we're expecting to admit Mr. Smith to a general medicine floor, we should focus our plan as a problem-focused approach. So this means that it may look a little bit different if he was going to the ICU from a systems approach, where we would talk about cardiovascular systems, neurologic systems, pulmonary systems, and GI. In this case, we're going to just focus on the acute pancreatitis. So as we said before, there's really no history mentioned of him having severe CHF or any other conditions that would, be, that would contraindicate us giving him large amounts of fluid. In this case, we're going to start with lactated ringers at 250 cc's an hour, and we're going to do that for 12 hours. It's important, as I said, to go ahead and check in on him every hour or so to make sure that we're not overhydrating him. We're going to put in for appropriate pain management for him and monitor his BMP to make sure that his BUN is not going up and that his creatinine is also staying stable, which are both signs of dehydration and, and organ damage. We should repeat a CBC to make sure that his white count is improving as we're treating him appropriately, because if it's going up, we may consider that he may develop an infection or has a secondary process that we may have missed on the initial evaluation of the patient. A right upper quadrant ultrasound would also be indicated for this gentleman just to make sure that he didn't have a biliary stone that had passed and caused this episode of acute pancreatitis, especially since his history, as we recall, was not very consistent with heavy alcohol use, but more so small risk factors that we said coupled together probably led to all this. If Mr. Smith felt that he was able to eat, and it sounds like he does, we'd go ahead and place a diet order in for him. If he said that he was not able to tolerate, then I would recommend placing a nasogastric tube and starting tube feeds that way. Based on his overall presentation, there is currently no indication for initiation of antibiotics at this time. As, as we're continuing to monitor his CBC as well as vital signs and overall clinical status, we can make a decision whether or not we think it's time to start antibiotics at any point or not. As you see here, that we did not mention anything about a CT scan, and we're not planning to start one right away either. It's important to recognize that since we made the diagnosis based on the first two of the three criteria, imaging was not indicated for him at this time. 
I also would make the point to say that if in the next couple of days he's not getting better, or if there's concern for necrotizing pancreatitis, I think contrast-enhanced CT on day four and beyond is more than appropriate. Doing it a little bit earlier than that, however, has a potential of missing necrosis and giving us a false sense of security. And so in his case, right now it's not indicated, but it's something that we should keep on the table. Now that we've had a little bit of time to talk about the general presentation, evaluation, and treatment of a patient with acute pancreatitis, just a couple of take-home points for you. It's important to eyeball the patient as soon as you hear about them. Hemodynamic status is something that is often overlooked, but it's one of the most important factors in the treatment and evaluation of a patient with acute pancreatitis. It's important to do a thorough history looking for triggers that may be associated with acute pancreatitis. Some of the things that we should always think of is alcohol use, biliary symptoms, new medications, recent procedures, and family histories of autoimmune diseases. In the case of patients with evidence of acute end organ failure, such as elevated lactates, elevated creatinine, or even an elevated troponin, it's important to think about stepping them up to an intermediate or even a higher level of care, such as a medical intensive care unit. And then last, but probably one of the most important, is this. Intravenous fluid is the mainstay of treatment of acute pancreatitis, and it should be always, always, always initiated as part of treatment. Now that you're all experts in the management and diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, there will be a link provided to a primer that I have written for acute pancreatitis. It's a quick one-sheet reference that may help you in the event that you've forgotten all the things that we discussed during our presentation today. I've also written a simple case with the help of Dr. Harry Aslanian to help you practice some of the things that we talked about by going through a case with a step-by-step -step approach and some of the clinical reasoning. A lot of my information came from the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines that were updated as recently as 2013, as well as a relatively recent paper from The Lancet that I think would be of benefit to any of you who are interested in getting more information about the tr diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes in acute pancreatitis.